Well, no doubt we can agree that training our people in our business is a great investment in their growth and our business performance. But we're often held back by the costs involved, the logistics, and the ability to see an immediate return on investment. But this week, we're going to chat with Tyson Clark, who's got a solution that makes training really simple to digest and fosters a culture of high performance in our business. Welcome to the Transformation Show, where successful pharmacy owners and technology partners help you to build a better 21st century pharmacy by embracing technology. Here is your host, Robert Starr. G'day everyone and welcome back to Transformation, the only dedicated podcast in the world where pharmacy and technology collide to bring you, the motivated pharmacy owner, all that you need to build your smarter, more successful 21st century business before it's too late. My name's Robert Starr, your host and guide on this fantastic journey of ours, all the way through into our second century, episode 101. Big show today. I will say straight up that uh, it has been a few weeks since we've been back on air, and you're going to hear a little bit about why that is and what you've got coming your way very, very soon. We're going to be catching up with Tyson Clark, who's the founder of Voicester. And it's probably a technology that may be little known to some of you, but it's an incredibly powerful technology platform that enables training to become easily digestible for your teams, driving a culture of high performance. I often had a thought after I recorded this episode with Tyson is that we're heading into an Olympic year and we often sit back and remark and marvel at how these athletes are able to churn out these remarkable performances at the Olympics to claim ultimately the gold medal and we often don't pay respect enough to their journeys and we hear a lot about how they've had to train what their regimens have been like the commitments the sacrifices and a lot comes back to just having a culture of high performance around them and no doubt every single day they are doing something to incrementally improve themselves in search of that gold medal at the Rio Olympics. And that's something that we need to bring into our pharmacy businesses. Tyson talks a lot about how he likes to steal from the freaks and inject it into our greater pharmacy workforce so that the freedom and fluidity of this great pharmacy information techniques, selling techniques can be evenly distributed right across Australia to drive high performance across the industry. So I know you're going to get so much out of our chat today day. We'll have a little check-in. How's your week been? Has it been a good one? How's your winter going? It's certainly down here in Melbourne, the cold is biting and certainly as we're starting to see, particularly through the pharmacy business side of the Transformation Lab, a lot more patients coming through with all of the symptoms that we usually expect and it gives us a lot of opportunity to consider the way we tackle and any some innovative ways of being able to tackle cold and flu season. In one of my uh, Facebook live broadcasts and you have if you haven't already jumped on those you can just head across to Facebook and find the transformation or I think it's Robert Star slash transformation Facebook page and there's a whole series of Facebook live videos. I'm going to mention in a moment why I'm doing those and the frequency and what we've been covering so far but I caught up and I attended two really important conferences down here in Melbourne. One was the Connect Expo and the other was Retail and Customer Tech X. And if you're following the show, you'll remember I attended the same two conferences last year. And once again, thanks to Association Communication Events for their great hospitality. But one of the key things that I took out of Retail and Customer Tech X is a really simple one, one that I reckon we can all inject into our services and our product mix around cold and flu season and that's simply inviting our patients the same way as Apple do when they invite us for a personalized shopping experience when they give you the ability to book in at the Genius Bar and really be able to personalize the cold and flu season for families, the preparation, the symptom control, the recovery, 
All of those things can be personalized for each patient and just even giving them the opportunity to book in for a personalized appointment. Sure, the majority of times we're not going to charge for that, but it's something that we need to demonstrate a demand and it will differentiate ourselves from all of the other competitors around us. So that was the challenge I took away out of that Facebook Live video. And of course, you can get that also at facebook.com forward slash robert.star as well. Reason for the delay in the episode. So I spoke to quite a number of listeners at APP and we felt that it was time to experiment with a delayed frequency. So from the beginning of this year, we've been going to air roughly every fortnight or three weeks because what I found is that many listeners were coming to me last year saying, look, Rob, you're in episode 80 or 90. I just haven't been able to catch up. So I'm just going to go to the latest one and I won't be able to get to the back catalogue as well. So part of the reasoning of doing that was to to allow listeners to get into all of the episodes and the great valuable content that many of our guests have brought to you as well. But also on the other side as well, we've been heavily investing all of our time and resources into the Transformation Lab experience, which all of you will get the opportunity to participate in later this year. And we've had some really exciting but very time-heavy uh, installations and implementations happening in the Transformation Lab that is just simply meant that I needed to put 110% behind that. So this one has been four weeks after episode 100, but we've got some really exciting guests coming up your way, as I'll mention to you straight after this week's episode interview with Tyson as well. So if you want to find out a little bit about what's been happening in the last four weeks as well, you can also get that from the Facebook page as well. But I've also been producing some content in some other interview platforms. And the reason I've been using those is there's a lot of immediacy, there's a lot of rawness about it, and it's not polished. Um, Often the Transformation podcast episodes go through quite a number of edits uh, before they go to air, but this is completely raw and live, and you can literally see step-by-step how the rower automation unit which has gone into the transformation lab has been implemented into the business and the associated shop fit and IT works that have gone around that Um, but what I'm also going to commit to as well is doing some live sessions in the transformation lab every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. So there'll be a different topic each week and I'm going to release those through Facebook as well and also through the email list if you're subscribing at robertstar.com as to what we're going to cover in those weeks as well. So they'll be rolling out in the next few weeks and so what we aim to do is do that every Wednesday at 8 a.m. right before we start up and uh, basically to allow any questions to come through and if you're working through any implementations or planning programs processes around any of the technology that we're working through here in the Transformation Lab. I believe you'll get a lot of value out of it and hopefully get some great key learnings out of some of the things that we probably would have done differently um, had we had the opportunity to do that again as well. So I'll certainly point you to that and something that we'll bring up in future shows as well. Anyway, without further delay, we'll head across to Tyson for this week's interview. Tyson Clark, welcome to the Transformation Show. Hey, Robert, thanks for having me. Oh, look, great to have you, Tyson, and I think it's fantastic to have you on the show today, particularly as we're going to get into talking about our people, which, of course, are our best assets in our pharmacy. And often we look at our balance sheets, not really look at our people too well, but there's a lot we can do in optimising their role in our pharmacies moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I look forward to it. I think it's a, I, it's a very under tapped resource is our people and um, that's usually what I find has the most uh, untapped in terms of uh, profit sources in our businesses and finding great ways to distribute that information. Yeah, fantastic. And I guess before we jump into that, um, you know, how did you get into the pharmacy industry and uh, I guess what have you seen from afar? Uh, well, it's a funny story how I came in. It was actually with a bet. Um, a buddy of mine and I we had a bet on who could have the sexiest tummy in a week. Uh, it's a bet I unfortunately lost. It was a glorious loss. It's been a delicious loss. But um, I went into a pharmacy, a, a group that uh, old friends of mine, the Kalana Pharmacy Group up in Cairns, and I met with 
a young lady. She was very lovely. Um, but I was doing the selling. I, I was getting the solution. And uh, I, I was really having to push. And she it seemed like she was very concerned about me, but also very concerned about stacking the next shelf. Um, and so I went to the owners and I said, look, you know, your, your staff are really lovely, but, you know, I think they could use some help in sales. And so uh, Matthew, the general manager of Kalina Pharmacy Group, sort of said, yeah, actually, you know, I really could use some help. Uh, and he gave me a rundown of how the industry was looking and um, we were off to the races. So uh, that was about the uh, I, he had a, an interesting geography problem. Um, where he had four towns in one uh, city and in, in uh, sorry four pharmacies in one city and four pharmacies in another where uh, you know he's a good friend and I didn't really want to take his money if I wasn't going to get a result so that was where we came up with some of the tech that we're, um, we're going to talk about today. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I guess it's just really getting that focus more on the people now that walk into our pharmacies as opposed to the products and the transactions that we've been so well known for in the past. But, uh, you know, really shifting our people's focus back onto the patient and being that patient centric destination. So I kind of think it's going to be such a great transition for us to all make, um, you know, not just in individual pharmacies as well. Yeah, yeah. Um... Like, like I said, you, you're very hard pressed to find staff that aren't nice or that aren't friendly. Uh, I think everyone's friendly, especially in, a, in an interview or you know with a with a customer right away. I mean, sometimes you find people that aren't nice and just shouldn't stay in retail at all. But um, we've got a lot of nice people and we've got a lot of experienced people. But I think the number of years and the number of uh, gems of knowledge. Uh, in the industry is very poorly distributed. Um, one thing that I like to sort of communicate to clients is, look, you know, you've got 100 staff here and your average number of years experience is probably four years. You know, some people have been in the industry 30 years or 25 or, or this is their first day, but, you know, you've got sort of 400 years experience here. How are we leveraging that? How are we distributing that to, to everybody? So we've got a lot of untapped potential and if we open our uh, open our minds to the possibility that we can distribute that, then we can really kick some amazing goals and um, have a sort of my my goal is to have a democratic sharing of information throughout the industry of of optimized uh, methods and techniques, and um, and that's what uh, my software voice is about. And I guess it's, you know, it can really be seen in pharmacies when we have our best exponents in, within our business. And that might be someone who knows every single product inside and out, has a great rapport, a great conversation style. Uh, but too often, as we've seen in our pharmacies, these people are the ones that, uh, you know, can't be working 80 hours a week, which might be the opening sphere of time for our pharmacies. And so, therefore, our customers might get a very, very different experience and uh, really zeroes in on the need for that really strength in, in training and identifying our weaknesses and strengths amongst our people. So, moving moving to our flexible training that we obviously then need you know i guess in the early stages of developing uh voister and moving down that pathway you know did you see that evolving in other industries and you know it naturally became a great opportunity for pharmacy um actually voister came about not from other industries well i i my uh my background in the cell phone industry um has paved a lot of, like I've stolen a lot from uh, the cell phone industry. We have a, a metric called uh, APO or accessories per opportunity. Basically, it means that, you know, when you sell a new contract for a phone, you want to add as many accessories as possible. And they're very stringent about putting, making that uh, information transparent to the staff because when they don't, as soon as it's not under their nose, it, it's sort of, you know, the, the sales drop off tremendously in a, in a really big way. So in our industry, however, I've worked with numerous pharmacies, and this is why businesses like uh, PharmaData and Instago are really great because they, they give us powerful information. They, they put it right in front of us. Um, so I'm, I'm working with businesses now 
working out how many accessories, sorry, instead of accessories, how many retail items or, you know, vitamins or uh, superfoods per script. So we recognize a script as an opportunity. Um, and that's, so one of the things that I stole from another industry is really just transparency of information. Uh, and one of the other things I've noticed that's similar is that, you know, the less obstacles there are to a piece of information, the greater you are going to distribute that information. And the less excuses you're going to have to deal with. But did you look at the metrics? And they're like, oh, no. So you just shove it right in their face, and they don't really have a choice. And that's, that's great because it's powerful information. You don't get the excuses, and you do get people doing things, actually making executions based on effective data. Hmm. And, and I guess when we compare to where where we are right now, you know, majority of pharmacies engage in some form of group training, you know, whether that be an internal staff meeting where the pharmacist or pharmacy owner or retail manager might be delivering uh, some pearls of wisdom and some strategy throughout the month uh, or having product representatives come visit the pharmacies, which are becoming, I guess, less and less as uh, those companies uh, invest less in their pharmacy relationships relationships and obviously there's all these other things that sometimes get in the way whether it be the minimum three hours of engagement we need to invest in as well as potentially venue food all of these types of things to get people together um, but you know just like you mentioned there it could just simply be a group of people who are you know being presented with a whole lot of information some are just passively absorbing some may be actively asking all the questions and they funnily enough he tend to be always those champions in our businesses. So it's really looking at how we can bridge the gap between those best and worst performers. And uh, I guess in, in, that, in that relevance, what, what, have, what have you seen as been effective strategies in that regard? Well, that, that was how I came to uh, invent uh, Voister. Um, when I was working with the Kalana Pharmacy Group up in North Queensland, they had four stores or three stores in Townsville and four stores in Cairns. And I know these guys, I've known them a long time, and I wanted to do right by them. And I sort of was like, you know, I don't think this is going to work because I know how sales training goes. I'm one of these self-important, look at me, look at me kind of people. Um, and that's a lot of the, you know, how sales training goes. They get up there and, and, they, and they jabber. And um, some people will take in some of the information, but nobody has an attention span of an hour. It just doesn't work. Um, and so I wanted to do the right thing by these guys. And I sort of looked at um, my history in learning sales. And probably the boot camp of sales training is door-to-door -door sales, which I did in North Minneapolis in Minnesota in the States. And I can still tell you my opening line to, so I was telling, selling telecommunications again. And the opening line, I worked in this business, uh, oh, geez, 10 years ago. And I can still tell you the opening line, which is, hi, my name's Tyson. I'm with Quest Communications. I'm supposed to introduce myself to the person who handles telecom. That's you, right? Okay. And I did that job six months. But I was like, well, what was it about that that I could steal and take to this industry so that I know that some competence would be picked up? And the answer was repetition. I'd wake up in the morning. I'd be in the shower. I'd be saying my lines. Uh, I'd, I'd be ironing my suit. I'd be saying my lines. I'd be driving at work, pitching the steering wheel, saying my lines, and then we get to work. We do uh, role playing for an hour, and then we go out in the field and hit 35 to 50 businesses a day. So there's a tremendous amount of repetition in there that has sort of sunk that information into my brain even 10 years later. So that was something that I really wanted to steal from um, in order to get an effective result with the pharmacy group that I was working with. But I didn't, I also had to ask another question. Well, you know, repetition of what? We can repeat anything. We can repeat our mistakes. We can repeat, you know, um, some of the sales training that I did in other industries was all multiple choice. And I've been in sales a long time and I still haven't had a customer come to me and say, look, Tyson, um, my problem is this. I've got answers A, B, or C. Which one is it? Nobody can summarize the answers that well. And doing a repeti repetition of those doesn't help me to retain the information. So I was like, well, you know, they've got to actually speak the answer. Um, 
And then the third, the third thing was the information that I learned in door-to-door sales was potent. It was effective. It had efficacy. It worked. So this is my big gripe with uh, traditional sales training is that we're not selective enough about the kind of information that is presented. So we've got to let's let's take responsibility for what people are learning by presenting them with extremely potent, proven, profitable, and useful information to them. So that's where Voicester came in. We made very short um, videos that were based on um, optimize, you know, the the best methods that the company was delivering. I think the first one was a, a loyalty program with uh, um, Andrew Pattinson. You had him on a little yeah. bit. Yeah, uh, Instago. So we went and we found the best loyalty person sign up, sign up girl, right? And I said, what are you doing? And she told me. And then I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Well, now I've got a really good gem of information, but how do I distribute it across two towns? You know, I can't go there and expect them to do it after telling them this is how you do it once because it, it just doesn't work. So um, I fumbled around and I... I uh, luckily was able to get a few volunteers to, to be on video for me. <laughs> we uploaded the video and we made this voice operated training and, um, we killed it. We increased, uh, loyalty by sort of 70% in the first week and, um, 110 and then up after, after that week. So it, we sort of saw, we did a small test. We tested it. It was like, you know, we didn't put a great amount of effort into it, but we, we found the optimized technique punched it into the into this brand new clunky software and um, and distributed it and we've invested a lot more time a lot more effort and research into making it uh, a really powerful piece of technology today and I guess when we when we think about the technology you know as you hit hit on then you can repeat anything a number of times so long as it's the right message and it's the best practice of what's delivering results in the business and you know it just gives that you know virtual microphone that you can deliver a message to just about anyone and we see this with everything we do whether it be social media whether it be email it the content isn't the problem. It's sometimes the uh, the distribution methods and making sure it's effectively read. And I guess for us, where we've seen in the past, you know, we've used e-learning modules. It might be different academy trainings that groups have offered, webinars, videos. But, you know, it's that element of really just absorbing information but not actually physically doing anything with that. So, you know, how how is how has your platform allowed, you know, the participant to really, you know, get stuck into it in the implementation phase of that training a lot quicker? Um, well, the, the something congruent and consistent throughout any sort of piece of information or uh, any work that I do with anyone basically is, is accountability. Um, so uh, there's an I, Voicester is actually an acronym, it's uh, Voice Operated Interactive Sales Training App. So they actually have to do something. Um, and they have, it has to be recorded and, and it's reported to the people who are responsible for the training to actually happen. Um, it's designed to only be sort of three, four or five minutes a day. Uh, it's a micro, they call it, uh, this is new word they've called uh, micro training. I didn't know that when I got into this, but that's what they're calling it is a micro training. And then you just do that in, in, in sort of high repetition. But unless you're held accountable and in the earliest versions of voice to we weren't, we had to just call each of the stores and say, how are you doing it? You know, what are the numbers, et cetera, et cetera. But now, you know, all cloud-based. I actually, um, the, the back end of Oyster is very accessible to the businesses, but I've sort of taken them out of that equation because it's not interesting to them. I just email results now. I email, hey, you know, John's done, done her training, uh, 20 repetitions this week. Mary's done 64 et cetera, et cetera. So again, I'm removing those obstacles and putting the effective data right into their face. And that's really, um, you know, the doing part is where, is where the results come from. We could talk about it until we're blue in the face, but um, actually acting uh, on information and solidifying it in our brain somehow, it, it has to come through repetition. It has to come through actually doing it. And so um, yeah, accountability is where I think we've been able to kick some goals and actually make sure that people are doing the work and getting the results. 
Well, I think other, otherwise you're just measuring participation. And I think, you know, we've often looked at a KPI amongst our people management as number of trainings attended or number of meetings attended. But the number of meetings and trainings you've attended is probably not a measure of the effectiveness of that unless it really led to a tangible result from that person in their ability to serve the patient better. And, you know, whether that be measured through additional basket size, um, a greater sense sentiment, greater feedback scores, you know, all of that, you know, will keep that person accountable to, you know, taking on that action. But if all that's being measured is from a business owner point of view is, hey, Katie just attended all the trainings this year. She gets a bonus for that. Well, it's, right. it's a pretty short-sighted uh, KPI, isn't it? Yeah, she could go in there and take a nap. I probably <laughs> would. I'd sit in the back row and close my eyes. <laughs> and I think a lot of people do. Um, and they, they do exactly what you said at the start of the program was, you know, they start thinking about other things or how dare this guy come in and tell, tell me how to do my job, et cetera, et cetera. They'll come up with a million reasons. But the, the, the power is in the question and um, getting people to answer their own with their own uh, creativity is very, very powerful in terms of creating cultural change because, you know, we sort of don't see it, but they're going through big changes too. You know, they might not have envisioned this for their for their job. Um, a lot of pharmacists, I've got this theory, and I'd, I'd say it's probably 60% correct, correct 60% of the time, is that pharmacists have these great big brains and they probably re relied on their big brains to avoid the very situation that we're in today, which is having to make more sales. You know, it, it, it's not the kid, uh, you know, the C student in the class is probably the best salesperson because they're, they're a bit cheeky. Um, they're, they're not necessarily going to follow the rules all the time. But the A student is probably not going to be your best salesperson in, in a school setting. And so you, I don't know if you, you would you say that's a fair assessment of, of pharmacists? Well, look, certainly there's, there's, a, there's a lot on every pharmacist and pharmacy owner's plate right now in terms of having to balance all of those hats, looking at the fact that operating costs continue to go up and, you know, the need to do more with less is a case of, well, what can we cut? What can we shortcut? And often, you know, it does mean that, uh, you know, those processes aren't being, I guess, <laughs> externalized instead of internalized and brought into our team as a way of delegation or increasing their level of activeness with patient interactions that we have to take on these problems ourselves and um, you know certainly I think you know being able to you know get a better customer interaction as opposed to a transaction it's going to be very key to be able to I guess change our roles as, as it probably was when um, you mentioned Andrew Pattinson a short time ago we spoke about with him the fact that you know if we are extroverts ourselves as pharmacists we will hire extroverted people right. and if we're introverts we'll hire other introverts and it's a case of well we need to actually diversify our team and uh, you know take on those that are capable of leading the way in all sorts of other areas as well. Yeah, I really love it. I, I've seen, I really love the diversity. I love seeing cheeky people in pharmacy. It's, <laughs> they really stand out. But, um, you know, the, the, the little, little spice of uh, naughtiness, I mean, it doesn't go a very long way. When You've got to follow a lot of rules in the entire health sector, right? Because if you don't, um, people can die. And when people die, it makes it very hard to sell them more products. So we want to avoid it at all costs. But having that diversity of, uh, of personalities really adds to um, the number of solutions that you can provide the number of solutions that you can provide because they'll think about things in a different way. Yeah, no, look, it's, it's a really interesting one because, again, you know, where where we look at each patient, you know, we've got a, a different set of eyes as a pharmacist, but, you know, those of us who, you know, have our pharmacy assistants that play key roles in the business, they understand some of the patients even better than the owners do as well. You know, they've also got to, uh, you know, I guess add, add their value in their own unique way as opposed to, you know, just being do, doing it a certain way um, that everyone should be doing and uh, probably taking on board those differences as positives rather than a way of breaking the mould. 
Yeah. Yep. I, I um I really enjoy working with with the diversity of the groups and I, when I when I'm looking to optimize a technique um, and I'm looking for uh, freaks of nature or rock stars or the people that are definitely above or even below average, I, I want to go and find out what those people are doing and, and and exactly how I can replicate or stop it depending on whether it's it's uh, producing good or bad results. But one of the exciting things that I look for is um, I love finding people who are good at their job despite their personality. You know, you've got certain personalities that would naturally be good in a sales role or good as an accountant or, or good, um, you know, cutting fish. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But when you find a person that is not necessarily suited to doing a job, let's say it's a, a non-gregarious salesperson that's fantastic at getting results, then it's not who they are. And who people are is very, very difficult to replicate. But it's what they're doing. And what people are doing is very easy to replicate. So that really gets me excited is when I find someone that's, you know, um, for example, you know, or, or we found uh, some really great techniques on increasing retail items per transaction or the basket size. Um, and we found some some people that weren't your typical salesperson. And so I have to ask them, what are you doing? Why are you so bloody good? And they really love the conversation. And then they can, when it's just something that you're doing, then I can package that up and send it to everybody else. But I, I you know, it's like, it's like Robin Williams. You can't bottle Robin Williams and sell him to everyone. He's he's a unique uh, he's a unique kind of character. But when you can bottle what you can bottle what somebody does, and I find I'm really dedicated to distributing those in efficient and effective ways. Yeah, and and I guess it's just taking that whole shift in mindset, and that you know the the analog world sometimes of uh, pharmacy, whether it be, you know, the in-person meetings, trainings and so forth, hasn't closed. But, you know, in order to be able to leverage our best practice and keep ahead of PR releases, new product releases, all sorts of things that are impacting our teams, you know, and if you are running a group of pharmacies, being able to roll that out in a really quick manner, uh, particularly where it it might even be something that happens quite quickly, you know, whether it be a, a news report, a product recall, all sorts of things, you need that to be able to scale that. Um, and I think that's where, where the technology plays a role. But I guess for, for our listeners, Tyson, you know, listening to this, you know, hearing more about, you know, how your platform and how technology can really help to scale that message across their entire teams. What would you recommend as the, I guess, the first baby steps into moving towards that? Because, you know, it's a very, very, you know, it is a change management piece of having to look at how you're going to deliver those messages to your team away from what you're currently doing, which may just be all the physical face-to-face. You know, what would you recommend are those first few baby steps into to starting to, you know, I guess, scale that message across your team? Well, first, I'd make sure that it's the right message um, and, and, and test that uh, vigorously uh, because we're in a very uh, evidence-based industry, and that's a great thing. It's a really great thing. And to ignore that is, is not going to work out with the culture that we are. So first, if you've got a message that you want to deliver, uh, make sure that it, you know, that you're 100% confident that it's a profitable direction, that it's one that you want to go. Um, one of my first jobs was finding out um, what the profitability of a customer is. I'm a big fan of a guy called Jay Abraham. Um, his book, his most uh, famous book, I guess, is uh, Getting Everything You Can Out of All You've Got. And I wanted to find out. Um, what, who were the most profitable customers that we have and you know where do they sit in terms of profitability and they're usually sort of 10 to 15 times more valuable than the average customer and then what what is it that we're doing to facilitate them coming to us so I, I went in I you know I think uh, Game of Thrones was big at the time and so I, I sent them a, a a handwritten letter with a wax red wax stamp and 
and uh, I think I put a scratchy in there too to say, hey, you know, can I come and can I buy your coffee for being such a great customer? I sat down, I, I asked them, you know, a bunch of information. Where else do you shop? You know, why are you so good to us? You know, what can we do to better facilitate this? Who else do you hang out with? When you find out all these inf- these pieces of information, you can't get, you know, you can put all of your effort into it. You can put all of your effort into that direction and be very confident that you're not going to get blindsided. And there's nothing more heartbreaking than doing a lot of work for the wrong reasons. And so as a first step, I would want to make sure that the data that your systems are showing you is supportive of whatever energy you're going to spend on it. And so, you know, that's where you, you look at, you know, your, your retail sales, your items per transaction, your, you know, your customer base. If you've got any loyalty programs are incredibly valuable for this reason, just for the amount of information that you can glean from it. It's tremendous. Um, and that's, you know, uh, Andrew Pattinson business again. Uh, and there's, there's others out there, so you don't have to use Instigo. But being able to say, okay, this is my top 10 of cust- top 10% of customers. This is probably the future of my business. What are they? Who are they? What do they look like? Where do they go to church? Where do their kids go to school? Find out who those people are and then find out if you really want to spend the effort on this direction. And then you'll be, you know, you, you'll spend it whatever effort you have to and you'll be far less likely to give up, which I think happens quite a bit. People get disheartened and disgruntled because it's, it's not easy. Well, I guess one thing that you'll take away from that conversation as well is that what have they liked about how your people interact with them? It may be how you interact with them, but it also may be how your other team members do and what they like and don't like. And uh, to, I guess, be able to isolate those best practices, um, you know, makes that really scalable across the team in that we know that our top tier patients are those that don't like x y or z and we can avoid doing that at all costs and uh you know essentially it might be that you know you've got a casual staff member someone who maybe only works once every four weeks but being able to give them those two or three nuggets of things they shouldn't do automatically improves their uh, performance and more importantly their the customer's experience as a result of being able to isolate that yeah that's a really good point i read an article recently i think it was on linkedin where <laughs> it said you don't have to be really smart, you just have to stop doing dumb things. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and we have to be, like, I, I'm, I, I realize how stupid I am at least six times a day. Like, I do some really silly things in terms of what it is that I'm trying to achieve. And we all do. And that's fine. And you have to be ready to see those things if you want to change them. So... Asking the negative side, like not being afraid, I, I, um, what did, you know, I think it was Bill Gates that says, you know, your, your unhappy customers are your most valuable source of information. Absolutely ask those customers, you know, have you had any bad experiences? Is there anything that we can do to do better? Um, and, and the other side too, you know, why, why do you come back? What is it that you like about this? And you'll find, like I've, I've done a lot of these one-on-one interviews, Robert, and that that I didn't, I didn't head in the uh, the service direction for this industry until I established that fact, and it and it's it's valid. It's valid. These are the people that spend a lot of money, um, are the ones that want a total solution or a service model. They want the intimate experience. They want to know more information about how to get an actual result, and they're not that concerned about how much it costs. They just want to get the job done with their body. Mm. It's an interesting trend that we're we're seeing now, and that um, you know, I was um, just flicking through a new book that uh, was only released a few weeks ago. Now it's probably going to give an idea of when we're having this chat too, as well. But um, uh, by a guy named Jay Beer, and um, or Bear, depending on uh, which part of America you might be listening to, okay. um, and uh, his book of Hug Your Haters, and uh, one of the uh, biggest amounts of research that he invested in that book was. Really really isolating the, the very key fact of how little we actually spend on our customer experience versus our marketing. So we will spend more money on trying to acquire new patients and new customers um, as opposed to looking after the ones that we currently have and worrying about what they can do to continually remarket our business to their local community. And you know what we're talking about here in terms of really fueling and engaging and empowering 
empowering our team uh, through better training and uh, you know keeping them accountable to that is really going to heighten that experience that each customer and patient's going to achieve in store and uh, a very very valuable thing when it comes to all of those things that we take for granted such as word of mouth and community sentiment that sits around us yeah what what one of the one of my most valuable lessons that I learned from um, working with Jay Abraham was there's only three ways to grow your business. How concise is that? That's a beautiful thing that you can you can learn. Anybody can learn three things, and there's only three ways. That is, increase the number of customers, increase the unit of sale, which is your basket size in in our industry, or increase the frequency of return. Okay, and when you get any one of those, you increase a little bit. But because they're multiplying each other, you get exponential growth. But it's, that, that's sort of besides the point. The point is you can focus on any one of these three areas and your your focus will, will, will leverage synergistically other areas. But also you won't be worried about 900 things happening, right? You can say, well, you know, there's only three things I can actually do. It's a lot more. It's a lot less stressful when you can when you can break it down like that. I think it's just a fantastic piece of information, and very few people have um, have read his work. It's just a great piece of work. Yeah, now certainly, uh, certainly one of the legends and essential reading for every listener as well. If uh, you're enjoying audio books like I do, it's uh, you know, always a, a great one to get stuck into. And I guess um, Tyson, as we as we as we look at this and we can see the, I guess the roadmap of how this will play out into our future. You know, what what do you see? You know, is this or perhaps this aside um, the biggest game changer that you could see? Um, that if time and resources are no barrier, you know, influencing pharmacies today. Uh, so the future of the industry is that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually, I spoke to another one of your guests, Hilary Khan, very recently, um, and we had this conversation. And I think she's uh, she's brilliant in what she does in in uh, making the store work for the business. And so we, we have different uh, approaches to the same result, but I think it's a collaboration. I think the pharmacy of the future in 10 to 15 years, I mean, really, there's no way that you're going to be a, a great pharmacy without really well-trained, um, very highly knowledgeable staff. I, I think that you know, and and the businesses that consistently try and improve that, that consistently have a, a methodology in place to gradually but consistently increase their staff knowledge, they're they're going to blow everybody else out of the water. It's not going to be a contest. Um, and then we've got to be smart about the data that's presented to us. You know, on a store level, uh, on a group level, we've we've got to be smart about grabbing that information and then actually executing it. Um, and so no matter what it is that you're doing, you're going to have to handle things on, on two sides. The hardest part, and like I, I remember when I uh, wandered around APP last year, it baffles me. Um, and I asked a friend of mine, I was like, well, what? the most powerful people in this industry are the people that you know work on the floor. It's the most people in the industry. They've got the, the, the most... Um, the most contact with the customer, they're going to do all the recommendations, they've got all of the trust, and none of them are here. <laughs> <laughs> Very and true. I, I, said, I said, why? And they just say, oh, it's too hard. It's, uh, it's too hard. And they're right. It's, it's really hard work to, to work with staff, to endure the 50,000 excuses that I've heard. I could tell you the order that, um, that excuses come in in this industry and, and, and in other industries as well. They're, they're in a different order. But it's, it's very hard work. But the businesses that do that better are absolutely going to crush their competition. Um, if, I, you know, if, if, my, if I've got a pharmacy group, Robert, and, and you've got a pharmacy group and we're in the same area, your group trains every day on increasing their knowledge and you pay less than I do with my, my monthly meetings, my monthly training, you're going you're gonna to blow me out of the water. There's no contest. You, your staff are gradually increasing their skills and mine are not. And that's how learning is done. It's gradually and it's consistent. Um, hmm. 
Yeah. And, and I guess as, as, as you isolate there, you know, a real key theme and, you know, perhaps that's coming out from your uh, semi-professional sport background is uh, the culture of high performance. If you invest on daily investment in whether it be physical activity or, you know, some form of uh, improvement on a personal level or in this case product knowledge improvement as well, you're going to outwork and, uh, you know, outperform someone who only does it once a month and, uh you know, then it really does become part of your culture and you can't wait for the next thing because that is part of your day. And, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, seeing it all unfold and following your journey and Voister's journey and uh, inviting you back in the not too distant future. Excellent. All right. Thanks for your time, mate. Thanks, Tyson. We talk so often about technology being a great enabler of greater things in our lifestyles, in our personal lives, and of course, in the pharmacy business. And today was no exception. My three key learnings, well, number one, it's a cultural thing. A culture of high performance has to be built and incrementally built upon. It's not something we can artificially just inject into our business or buy an app or a piece of hardware that does all of that for us. It's a culture that we need to foster and grow and use technology to enable it to come to fruition with a minimal of effort. And that's one thing that we need to really focus on when we're looking at our customer experience. A culture of high performance, or in this case, a higher level level of product knowledge, training, sales techniques is something that's going to enable our patients to have a greater experience in the pharmacy. And as we focus more on the value of customer retention, rather than always be consistently looking at ways to market our pharmacy to attract and acquire new patients, we should also be looking to how we can improve the experience for our existing patients. And a culture of high performance, particularly around giving them better product knowledge, is one of those things. Number two is just distributing the wealth of knowledge across our team. Every one of us would have people in our business that inherently know things better than everyone else. And it's often the biggest gap that harms us the most in as much that you can have a remarkable experience when that particular person, pharmacist, retail manager, pharmacy assistant is working, but when they're not, the performance level drops to the lowest common denominator. So being able to distribute that evenly across our team also enables us to test, measure and learn what messages, what techniques are working and which ones aren't. And number three is accountability and repetition. The whole concept of interactive training. How many times have we had training in our business where people will just simply attend and absorb information just so they get paid that minimum of three hours engagement? But what do they actually do with that information? And it's often the ones that ask the most questions, get most involved, that actually take away something from those trainings and implement it. And the great thing that I loved about the Voister platform and I can't wait to play with it, is one that your ability to force the person who's using it to actually do something. They can't just simply move on without actually generating a response, which of course does enable us as coaches and advisors to our team to provide feedback and a level of incremental improvement to improve our businesses every day. And that brings us to our transformation motivational quote of the week, which comes from Joe Paterno. And the quote is, when a team outgrows individual performance and learns team confidence, excellence becomes a reality. Coming up on next week's show, we're joined by Dr. Jesse Green from the Savvy Dentist podcast show, who's going to share with us how we can nurture and retain our patients to keep them coming back and inspire them to actively refer new patients into our business. I know you're going to love it. And if you've loved this week's show, leave a comment in the show notes. I harp on it, I know, but I appreciate it more than you know. And our guests like Tyson today are only too happy to answer any questions or respond to any comments and feedback you may have as well. And you can do that, plus access all the resources mentioned in this week's show by heading across to the show notes at robertstar.com forward slash episode 101. Have a great week, everyone, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week. Bye for now.